I nursed a dog man back to health. This isn't one of those stories people emailed us. It isn't one of the kinds of stories people called into our voicemail box either. This is a story that was told to me by a curious individual I had never encountered before. We were in an establishment where people go to celebrate, and it was the last night before the local mayor was going to disallow about 30% of the customers from coming back in any longer. The place was crowded, and there was that sense, like in the beginning of the movie Casablanca, that a lot of history and culture might be about to be flushed down the drain for good. Depending on how things played out, this might be our last night of freedom ever. People were more talkative than usual, and when this one guy overheard that I do this channel, he demanded we all give him the floor so that he could tell me, in great detail and depth, the Dogman story I'm about to relate to you in his words. Although, he kept telling me that he was gonna leave me his email and his phone number, he didn't even end up telling me his name. As a result, I have obviously not been able to double check any of the facts. This is just a story in a bar that I'm remembering as well as I can. I don't know for sure if that guy was telling the truth, but he did have an accent that sounded like he was from Virginia, which is where he claimed that all this happened. This is a pretty remarkable story, so I'm just going to go ahead and tell it. And we decided to call it, I Nurse Dogman, Back to Health. Here's my story. I saw a dogman fall from a great cliff on the edge of the Potomac River, and I got a friend to help me keep the body alive. We didn't expect the creature to survive longer, but we wanted possession of it before the government came in and claimed the thing. That's the basic story. Now I'm going to start from the beginning and tell you everything in order to settle down out there in the back so this way everyone can hear. It was a beautiful, perfect summer night in 2020 and I was piloting one of my craft on the Potomac merely to have something to do. I heard faint sounds of animals struggling in great stress echoing over the water. Then I saw two figures engaged in battle up atop the cliff, right at the edge. Those cliffs mark the line between Virginia and Maryland. Where the two fighters were fighting, that was Virginia. Out in the waters where my boat was, that was Maryland. Looking through my binoculars, I saw a brief glimpse of two large figures big enough to take my breath away. They appeared in silhouette against the reddish sky, but there was enough information in what I was seeing to understand that these weren't two human beings fighting each other. Obviously, looking at creatures from that distance at dusk, which can at best be seen in silhouette, it's not a good way to make a positive identification. That having been said, my heart was racing because I knew enough to know that what was happening was out of the ordinary. Honestly, I was convinced I was watching a fight between two Bigfoot. It had been my dream since I was very young to see Bigfoot in real life, and the blood was pumping through my veins when I was seeing these glimpses through the binoculars. When the creature fell off the ledge, I dropped the glasses and watched it land in the trees below with my naked eye. I then called down to my crew, two of which had been watching the same thing as me. We briefly discussed calling the authorities, but then we changed our mind and went to shore with first aid and a stretcher. We tore into the bush until we found the big, hairy, smelly body. It was lying on its side, unconscious, but its large chest heaved up and down, indicating that it was still breathing. Up close, it did not really resemble a Bigfoot at all. It did not, for example, have big feet. I wasn't sure what the twisted body was supposed to look like before it had been broken, but a crash from a height does not cause your feet to turn into dog paws. There is no fall from any height that will change your face from looking like that of a Bigfoot to having a long snout like a wolf or a dog. This looked like an injured canine, albeit a very, very large one. I had seen something fighting that was bipedal. My men did as well. This was confusing to all of us, but since the size was certainly the same as the form that we had seen falling, we reasoned that this had to have been what we saw fall. 
My medic did what he could and we got the large black dog back onto my boat. We looked online trying to find the kind of dog that resembled this one but we drew a blank. Even if this wasn't a Sasquatch, it seemed to be more than just a dog. I needed a makeshift hospital off the radar of the law, the public, and the press. A place to restore the dog to health if possible. I had no facilities like that of my own. I knew a guy I had done some business with a few times. I thought he might be interested in seeing this pooch. He had a lot of theories about the North American upright walking canine for reasons I can't get into and I thought he would want to help me out with this particular project. I wasn't sure that I had a dying werewolf on my boat, but I wasn't sure I didn't. He had my boat meet his helicopter at an undisclosed location, and we did a MASH-style airlift for the dogman. Me and one of my crew hummed that Alan Alda theme song as we flew out of there. Some people get confused when talking to me about all of this, and they think that we helicoptered the creature from where he fell off the cliff. That is not true. We rescued him onto the boat, made arrangements for the boat to receive the helicopter at a different and secret location, and then the cryptid was taken to a secret place that belongs to the helicopter guy. That's where the dogman or whatever he was would be afforded the chance at healing his broken bones. Let's call the helicopter guy Dr. X, even though I don't think he's actually a medical doctor. I think he just employs them. Anyway, he was king of this little part of the world, and even though he didn't wear metal armor and a green cloak, he still reminded me of Dr. Doom from the Fantastic Four comic books. So Dr. X had his men in lab coats take care of our mystery pooch while I got to hang around and watch. At first they would consult me about what we should do next, and then after a short period, they began to just do what they wanted without even cluing me in beforehand. Soon, they were giving me stink eye for even asking questions. Dr. X and his people sedated the creature, then kept it that way for well over a month while placing its limbs in casts to give them time to heal. During the process, which was all video recorded, I'm certain, I began to lose control of what was happening. I was told to stay out of the dog room. I was forced to watch the creature on the video monitor from another location. I was treated as an annoyance when I was pretty sure that was my dog creature that these people were experimenting on. You could tell from their increasingly heightened reactions and behavior concerning that animal that they were becoming more and more convinced that they had their hands on something important. Nobody ever said that to me in words, but I think this was another reason they were trying to force me out of the picture. They wanted this prize for themselves. They didn't want me to realize what I would be giving up to them. I know that my crew and I probably should have handed the dogman over to the authorities when we still had the chance, but let's face it, the authorities were no less corrupt than we were. It was already too late by then anyway. Dr. X and I had already decided to play God. The time approached when we knew the dog-headed creature's bones were almost fully healed. We had been moving his limbs in his coma to keep the muscles from fully atrophying, but the creature did appear somewhat thinner in that hospital room. I overheard conversations discussing allowing the animal space to exercise his limbs and come back to full strength. It wasn't known if he would even be able to stand at first. It wasn't known how he would react to waking up inside a hospital room. Really stupid, pointless, endless conversations about the monster's feelings. The decision was made, without any input from me, to revive him under the stars out of doors. The wolf creature would thereby feel better about it all, you see. I argued for security over feelings, so Dr. X had a large, clear, plastic dome-shaped tent erected in the rear of the facility. This way, the wolf could see the stars overhead, but we'd have an enclosed enough space that we could hopefully prevent anything disastrous from happening. Dr. X's medical staff kept mocking me for my worrying, saying that the dogman was not even going to be strong enough to stand up for another week at least. It was decided. The doctor and I would remain inside with some of his people monitoring the progress of events out in the tent. 
We had the ability to pull the plug in a few different ways, and we had security armed with tranquilizer guns surrounding the operating tent. If all went completely wrong, we had the ability to release gas pellets into the tent remotely and put everyone to sleep within a matter of seconds. Well, everything went wrong all right, and it did so quickly. When given an injection to revive him, the dogman opened his eyes almost immediately. Seeing himself surrounded by humans inside a giant tent, he became frantically agitated, pulling at his restraints, most especially the ones that crossed his chest and were bound together by the logo of Dr. X's company. It didn't seem to take any time at all for the dogman to be up off the table, a feat we had been promised would take days to happen after his restraints were removed. From a human-style sitting position with his legs hanging off the operating table, that dog-headed ape-man grabbed one of the medical assistants by his chest and flung him across the room with one arm, bowling over a number of the other workers and a lot of expensive equipment in the process. Even with atrophied muscles, he was still stronger than 20 men. We released the gas pellets from our end. On the monitors, we saw the remaining personnel collapse to the floor, and we saw the dogman run away on his very strong-looking hind legs past the edge of our video monitoring equipment. I watched that part of the video over and over and over again. The creature, whatever it was, ran upright like a man. I thought I might have detected a slight limp, but it was too short a segment of video for me to be certain about that. At any rate, it didn't take a week for the creature to get his strength up enough to walk again. The medical staff had completely underestimated this animal in every possible way. Dr. X started barking orders to people both in that room and outside, organizing a manhunt for that non-human creature. There was nothing for me to do but sit there and think, which had become a painful thing to do. When that dogman ran out of that pointless, stupid outdoor operating tent and got away, he still wore the logo of the doctor's company branded across his chest like he was a promotional toy for their brand. The dogman certainly was something the doctor had wanted to take credit for. If anyone was severely injured or worse because of that animal man's getaway, would the company be as willing to take the blame? Or was that why I was being kept around? To use as a scapegoat? To blame me if things went terribly wrong? What if they never caught up to the creature? What if the dogman got away and couldn't be recaptured? Would all this video be studied? Or would all the data be destroyed for legal reasons? Wouldn't the community that the creature was released into be able to sue? What if the whole state could sue? Who would they sue? The doctor? Or me? The disagreements between me and Dr. X got worse around this time, and I have to admit, I was beginning to become a bit paranoid as well. I wasn't sure who was out to get me, but I was sure someone was. It took over two days to track the beast down, but I was awakened with the news before dawn and told to meet with the doctor and his chief team at specific coordinates. When I arrived, we were hustled into an armored vehicle, then on the way informed that the dogman had been captured by a special operations team. They had him sedated and under control. The doctor and his team and I were to inspect him before he was brought back to the facility. We would be most likely to recognize if anything were different with him than before. Well... When we showed up at the coordinates that the team had given us, we found their vehicle all right. And we found some of the team. Or some parts of them, anyway. We did not see the dogman anywhere, though. It was a complete disaster. There were no survivors, other than the dogman, who was supposed to have been under sedation. What had happened? Had the creature really been sedated? Had it become used to the sedation? Did it require more to keep a healthy dogman unconscious as opposed to a sick dogman who had just fallen off a tall cliff? We reviewed the video and it did seem as though the dogman was in fact sedated. We see him in the video being fired upon with the tranquilizer weaponry, 
And we do, in fact, see that dogman collapsing to the ground in unconsciousness. We do, in fact, hear a bit of dogman snoring in the audio portion of the digital video. Then, we have some footage of the team tying the dogman into its constraints and placing it inside their ambulance, ready for us to inspect when we arrived. And then there's this footage of utter carnage, more sickening than a Lloyd Kaufman movie, but real. The werewolf is here. The werewolf is there. The werewolf is everywhere. I could see for the first time how effortlessly and gracefully it moved. Imagine something with the size and mass of a pro NFL linebacker, but with the nimble swiftness of a Bruce Lee. This feral dogman wasted no energy in a completely efficient takedown of the entire team in a matter of a minute. It looked like special effects. It didn't look real. I mean, it looked real when I saw the carnage with my eyes in person, but when I watched the video showing how it happened, it just didn't seem possible. That dogman creature, I actually took to calling it a werewolf after that incident, I don't necessarily mean that it's a shapeshifter. If it is, we've seen no evidence of that ability. What I'm referring to when I call it a werewolf is the way it seems to be able to heal from almost anything in a clearly superhuman, or dare I say it, supernatural manner. If it could recover from falling off a steep cliff that tall, why wouldn't it also have a quick recovery from, say, tranquilizer darts? The only reason it never woke up earlier was that they were pumping sedation into it, along with nutrients. They were keeping it drugged and sedated. In the ambulance, they tranquilized it when they shot it, but I think they assumed that meant the creature would stay out for hours, a much longer period than he actually did. If they had thought to instantly put him on a dripper with more of the tranquilizer in it, that might have saved all their lives. Every experience with an unknown species is a learning experience. You can't know what to expect until you learn what a dogman is. What we learn from this experience is that it, like the werewolf of legend, is able to heal far more quickly than should be possible by the laws of nature. It was at this point that I confronted the good doctor and, in front of everyone, asked him why we shouldn't leak this footage to the public. Let them see what we're dealing with here. Let them know the kind of danger that they're in with a monster such as this on the loose. The team that the werewolf took down were all professional fighters. If they stood no chance, then the public stands even less chance from this creature. The only thing to do when confronted by a dogman is to not be confronted by a dogman. Stay away. And if you can't stay away, then get away. The public needed to be told this, I explained to Dr. X. So, from that moment on, I was barred from Dr. X's property. Then, my homes were raided and everything with computer memory on it was confiscated. Confiscated is a fancy word for stolen. They wanted to make sure I had nothing I could leak to the public, and they succeeded. Then, they smeared me and I was amazed how fast a business that took a lifetime to build could be torn down using just a few simple lies. So I had nothing on them, I was smeared, and I was broke. You want to know what I did then? Huh? You want to know what I did then? I'll tell you what I did then. I came to this crappy bar, and I met you, and I told you this story, that's what I did. And if you want to know what I'm going to do next, the answer is, I'm going to survive. I mean, I'll either survive or I'll die trying, am I right? It's like Schrodinger's cat. Right now, I'm both alive and dead, but eventually the universe settles on one or the other. Only, I didn't learn that lesson from Schrodinger's cat. I learned that lesson from... The Dogman that I nursed back to health. Someone recently wrote me a nasty comment mocking the idea of Dogman teaching life lessons. Hell yes, Dogman teaches life lessons, including in this episode. I mean, if you don't learn a life lesson after meeting a Dogman, there's nothing that's ever going to teach you anything. This episode is dedicated to Kathy Barrickman, 
and to Julie Sadler and her family. Please keep these people in your prayers. Thanks. Now here's Henry. Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck 50 at peterbernard.com and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level. That gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email, as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, we'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 la scary That's 804-537-2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, Please keep calling back, and we can piece it together on our end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back for more scary stories.